and welcome back everybody to philosophy for the people and uh yes i do look like i've been living in a cave plato's cave and we're about to get out of it because we're gonna talk about the timaeus today uh jim is currently teaching it this semester and we like to be super productive and just yeah. tie whatever jim's teaching into content for all of you so if, if you're may. wondering where did this come from out of nowhere i thought you guys were doing uh um the politics we'll get yeah. back to that eventually we'll get back to it we'll get back to it we'll get back to it so we're going to do a little gear shift come back to plato now but great to have you professor thanks for being thank here. thank you man thank you as thank always you. always great to see you again always great to see you again cool. so what's happening you know you're teaching this thing and then it's it's been a couple Shoot, last time you were on the show was when you were at my house, which was a couple yeah, weeks ago. Yeah, now. it was like mm -hmm. Christmas time, right? It was actually, it was the week after Christmas, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just uh, got the semester going. Um, you know, the usual uh, the usual stuff, thinking, reading, right? Yeah. Doing some jujitsu, chasing my kids around. Yeah, so we were chatting around and uh, about this, and we kind of wanted to maybe focus in or emphasize um, Plato's natural theology. Yeah. Because this is, uh, and I sent you some stuff from Gerson and I've explained how he's kind of shifted me on how, what Plato is actually up to. Yeah. Um, and you know, my, my philosophical education has, has led me to realize there's kind of like two understandings of Plato. There is the understanding of Plato you get as an undergrad. And then there's like the secret club. Understand yeah, right. Plato. Yeah. And there's like he, what Plato's really about, right? Yeah. Right. And yeah. we're going to try and let people into that club today, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. That's spooky. Right. That's spooky secrets, pl this platonic yeah. society, right? Do yeah, you agree exactly. with that? <laughs> no, 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I, I actually think a big part of my own like maturity as a philosopher is becoming to like realize the philosophy 101 version of Plato is is wrong, right? It's, it's and uh, it's a straw man and uh, and I think we we misunderstand not only Plato by that but by the people we want to contrast with the philosophy 101 version of Plato yeah like I think you end up misunderstanding Aristotle then too I think you end up misunderstanding you know later people who are defining themselves in contradistinction to Plato who knew very well what Plato was up to for real not just the the, the simplistic uh, dualistic thing that that we we pass off as Plato Right. Yeah. And I think also, you know, this is something we talked about when we did the Republic and we're going to talk about today, too, is that it's it's like I think a lot of us, especially our sort of analytic philosophers, um, although I think I'm kind of far down the road of recovery on that. But um, like we want to act like there's this philosophical content in the dialogues in Plato that you can just kind of lift that out. Mm -hmm. And then like the literary rhetorical stuff doesn't really affect that all that much. Right. Whereas I don't think that's the case. I, I don't I don't I don't think Plato. I mean, I think the, the the literary rhetorical elements are there for philosophical reasons for Plato. Right. Do you see. And and so I think we always have to like look at these things in that broader context of what's going on in the text, where he positions it with other texts and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. and that just taking that stuff seriously has like brought out to me uh, a very, very different Plato than than what I had like sort of. Been, I shouldn't say trained to think about because like, you know, back at Purdue in my doctoral program, like Patricia Kurd was like really pushing, like, this is how you should think about Plato. And I think for, for myself and maybe a lot of other people, it was a lot easier just to stick with the, the Plato one-on-one kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is the cartoon, the cartoon version. But yeah. again, after I've spent time, well, time with you for, for one, after yeah. we did our study on Gerson, the Republic, yeah. That, yeah. but Gerson, especially more importantly, Gerson. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Gerson yeah. stuff has just been like, um, and it's not that I, I feel like, oh, now I know what Plato is really up to, but he becomes so much more interesting and compelling in so many ways yeah. Yeah. once you kind of move beyond the cartoon version. And we'll give concrete examples of what we mean by that as we move along, I'm sure. So yeah. where this will probably be a series. I suspect we'll yeah, do I a, probably so. a couple episodes on this. So, uh, Professor, I mean, gonna, where should we gonna, get started? Yeah. I'm going to drag the young people through it. I might as well get some internet out of it too, right? Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. right. All right. So we're back in class now. Where are we beginning yeah. this, Professor? So let me let me go with, okay, so I'm I'm using, you, you know, it's, it's going to be on when I brought two translations to the party, right? Okay. <laughs> right. But um, uh, just to, I mean, the cover here from the Penguin translation is the cutout from Raphael's School of Athens, right? Which I believe is in the Sistine Chapel, right? Okay. 
And you get the classic Plato and Aristotle where Plato is pointing up and Aristotle's one spin in the basketball, one's dribbling it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I always want to point out that Aristotle is not flat, man. That hand is it's angled. That it's is angled. a really subtle but interesting thing. Yeah. Do you think that was intentional in the art? I, do. I mean, given that piece yeah. of art, probably, right? Because every little detail tends to be so intentional. Yeah. Right. And uh, of course, there is the issue is it easier to paint? the slight arc of the hand as opposed to that i don't know i know mm -hmm. nothing about painting but i i don't think it's accidental to who aristotle is that the hand starts down it's work and working its way up right yeah, not right. that it's yeah. flat it's not just what? imminent there's a transcendence yeah. that's cool mind blown already yeah. and also if you i should have got the whole painting up but like if you look at the school of athens okay Raphael has them under a domed arc mm -hmm. right okay and so think of like the greek world view we're, you know, we're in this interlocking set of arcs, right? Or arches, right? And, you know, Plato's saying the reality is up over the dome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Aristotle's not denying that, right? It's like, it's, it's, yeah, it's, if you, if you take the angle of Aristotle's hand, you're going to eventually go over the dome too. Right. But the, but it's not a straight, it's not a rocket shot up. It's a moving right. up and through. Yeah. So yeah, this, cool. this, this will come up, this will come up for us. Okay. Anyway, so, yeah, so I, I think Raphael is doing something pretty damn profound in that painting in terms of really understanding Plato and Aristotle. Okay. But the reason I bring up that painting is if you look at it, Aristotle, okay, who, by the way, in the painting has, oops, the red hair. Right. We can't see the skinny calves, but we know <laughs> the chicken right. legs, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, I kind of want Plato to be a little more buff, right, than he is. Okay. But he's an old man in this one. Um, but Plato, Aristotle's carrying the ethics. Okay. And if you look at it, Plato is carrying the Timaeus. All right. So in the famous painting, uh, the text that Plato is, is, is pictured with is not the Republic. It's not the Phaedo, right? It's not the Sophist. It's the Timaeus. Okay. Now there's historical reasons for that. Um, I think basically because until like the Renaissance, now his like classes out there can correct me on this, but my understanding is until like the Renaissance, really the only complete text by plato that was had in the latin west was the timaeus like augustine that you would have yeah right and that, 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 had more right okay i don't know but I, like i think but that's that's the standard understanding that i have yeah, that's yeah. that's right yeah yeah exactly so maybe even going back to augustine like the, what they had was the timaeus so mm -hmm. when people in like the scholastic world are talking about plato they're talking about the timaeus they're not talking about the republic right mm -hmm. they're i mean per se right they're not talking about the Phaedo per se they're talking about the timaeus right which is interesting i think that makes a difference for how you read those other people when you talk about plato right when they're talking about plato okay um but also i think uh maybe just not just for historical reasons i think the timaeus probably plays a much more pivotal role in the platonic corpus than um maybe we, we've been like ready to admit before okay yeah yeah because one of the one of the very very important things about this thing um that i've always known but i didn't take very seriously until just now when, I, when i've taught i've never taught the timaeus before right and so you don't you don't really own something till you teach that thing right great point you know mm -hmm. right and, is that kind of what made you want to teach it by the way because just yeah because well, yeah, I mean, what, what got me going is as you know i have my my man crush on cdc reeve mm. and i just i decided to use his collection on aristotle's natural theology uh, Aristotle's theology calls it um, in my intro class, and then I thought, you know what, man, there's probably no way we can really understand that if we don't do the Timaeus first. Uh, so I said, what the hell? Let's just do this right for once, right? Right. And I'll drag the little people <laughs> through the Timaeus <laughs> and Aristotle's theology. Right? They don't know how good they have it, right? Because at least with yeah. you, they're not getting yeah. the cartoon 101 that I got. <laughs> exactly. Undergrad, I know. Right? Nor did I, right? Yeah. And so for, you have to keep in mind too. This is like my intro class, right? So like my intro class is quickly becoming this like uh pagan theology party that only dr madden's invited to right like, these people are, you can guys can kind of be in the room while i while you gotta I, you gotta stream the caveman in for one yeah, of these things yeah. just... <laughs> right but anyway so so yeah so i decided yeah let's let's go ahead and do it right and and so I, I probably aristotle's theology will make a hell of a lot more sense in contradistinction or in synthesis with plato's right yeah very cool okay. awesome yeah so that's why i decided to do it this semester um and uh, and then another, another reason is a buddy of mine who's who's a better platonist than i am basically dared me to do it right so here we are yeah okay um challenge accepted 
Yeah, and then, but an important thing is, is Plato writes this as a sequel to the Republic. Okay, now, I don't know how the dating of when the texts were actually, you know, penned, uh, fits there. But if you look at, you know, the, the, you know, the the hack at Plato, you know, edited uh, yeah. by Cooper, which is like the the definitive like mm-hmm. English translation of Plato, Cooper has in the ordering. He has the uh, Timaeus directly follow the Republic. Okay, so it's it. So not only narratively in the Timaeus is is it written as if a sequel to the Republic. It seems that in the historical ordering, if that's what Cooper's doing, it is in fact a sequel to, to the right. Republic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, and it's interesting um, in the actual dialogue, uh, Socrates does kind of say that there's 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 something lacking in my argument from last night mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. that we need to do now in a further discussion okay right, yeah. and what's very interesting is socrates is not the one who who provides that argument like socrates spends most of just hung over just hung of, over yeah. listening to it yep, okay? mm-hmm. yeah and maybe sleeping through it but but that that's interesting okay so and another thing which just shows how spooky this book is. Okay, so if you see here, the edition I have is the Tomatus and the Critias, okay, mm-hmm. and appended, because they are, in fact, like really a, like a single dialogue. Okay, yeah. so um, Critias is a character in the Timaeus, and then he takes over the conversation. That becomes the dialogue of the Critias, okay? And the Critias is about Atlantis. Yeah, Atlantis. Yeah. Okay, it's about Atlantis. Okay? Yeah, uh-huh. so this just got weird right this is fun this is fun, fun stuff yeah, right it's about uh-huh. atlantis okay so um and now and you now there's a whole there's a whole cottage industry of people out there who want to say that like if you look at the dates and like when certain cataclysms occurred that maybe plato is getting atlantis right but I, i'm gonna i don't know about all that and i'm gonna push back on it on the text at some point here but we'll talk about it anyway. okay so so what's going on in the Timaeus? so it, you know it's the day after um a party um, and Socrates is arranged to, on the next morning, hang out with these other guys, right? Uh, Hermocrates, um, Timaeus, and Critias. Okay. Um, I, I obviously in the Republic, those people are not there. Okay. Uh, in this dialogue, it's kind of ambiguous as to whether they were at the party or not. Okay. But but play, but Socrates has arranged to talk to these guys. He wants to talk to these guys in light of the conversation you had the night before. Okay. So that that what's Plato saying there at a literary level, like I need a further argument to show, like to really like pull off what I wanted to pull off in the in the prior dialogue. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Now, um, so what so you start out the Timaeus with uh Socrates says, Well, you know, last night I came up with what the ideal city would be, okay, what the ideal city is. And he goes through really fast, um, what it would be well you know you'd have your guardian class you have your crafts people and they would they would narrate the tween show meet separate everybody stay in your lanes do your thing we get a quick thing on the training of the guardians no mention of the philosopher king by the way we get we get a, a quick quick deal on the training of the guardians um as having to be both philosophical and martial because you have to be both philosophical and spirited okay and then we get the thing about marriage you know how it's going to be arranged and the eugenic bit and how children would be separated from their parents at birth, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now my take on that is it's, it's, it's interesting. So Plato only has Socrates review, review the, the most hoary off-putting details, right. Of the ideal. Okay. Uh, in his review of it the next day. Do you see mm-hmm. what I mean? It doesn't bring up the philosopher king, all the like the more like kind of grandiose stuff about it. It's all the like, we're gonna take away your kids, you're gonna like, you're gonna, you're gonna have forced annual dating right in a rigged lottery, all that stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think part of this is because he and this is an important thing in the republic, and I think he wants to emphasize it here is the ideal does not seem to be ideal from the perspective of the temporal world. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, like the ideal, like you don't go and find the ideal by looking around as to what you would want based on your particular human experience. Mm-hmm. That's just, that's not the ideal. That's basic particular human experience. Do you see that? So like, mm-hmm. like I think he, by doing like, by concentrating the hoary details, I think he, he already kind of like alienates the ideal from the real 
uh, actual world in a way, which is important for his argument. Okay. All right. So then he says, but man, you know, I just kind of wish I could know what a, a, I, what a real city would look like, what it would actually do in order, if it were built around the ideal, could I see one in action in the translation I'm using? It's like, I wish I could see it in action, in activity, in act, right? If, yeah. In, in motion, right? In, in motion, right? Mm-hmm. In act. Okay. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm just a philosopher. I don't have that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, but he's got these three guys, Hermocrates, Timaeus, and Critias are all guys who either in real life or in their fictional persona here are statesmen. Mm-hmm. Okay, so mm-hmm. he says you guys are statesmen and you're uh, philosophically trained to some degree. So I think you could tell me what a state patterned after the ideal would look like in motion. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you see the analogy, you got like the ideal and you've got something patterned after it. And then what would it be like to be in motion? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Now, I think some things to notice is these guys are all associated with Sicilian or Italian politics. Okay. Mm-hmm. And Plato has just got his ass run out of Italy or out of Sicily for his attempts to like instantiate an ideal state. So these are weird experts for him to pick, right? You should mean okay. Um, because he's he's just run afoul of politics in Sicily. Right. Okay? Uh-huh. And they're also, uh-huh. All right. Now, but I think that's not accidental too. So mm-hmm. so um Timaeus and Hermocrates and Crates say, Yeah, we've thought about it and we want to do this for you. We want to give you the ideal, or we want to give you what a city would look like that was patterned after the ideal. Okay? Right. But it's interesting, though all of them are contemporary politicians, they appeal to no contemporary city whatsoever, and mm-hmm. they tell them they tell a myth mm-hmm. about ancient primordial Athens and its struggles with the ancient primordial city of uh Atlantis. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's interesting. If you want to know what uh, something in the actual is that would be patterned after the ideal, we have to tell a myth. Yeah. We can't really appeal to what's really here. Mm -hmm. We have to appeal to a myth. Okay. You see, I think that's really interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and so then, so then, you know, you get a quick telling of the, 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 the myth of Atlantis, right. And how, it rose to power and then like the 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 original athens that no one remembers because there's been cataclysms and the cycle of the universe has like destroyed and, and resurrected athens several times since then mm-hmm. right right and we, we get a story but if indeed um like at one time athens did like go to war with atlantis and kick their butt and why because athens at the time was patterned after the ideal but note the current one isn't because we can't use that as an example mm-hmm. right okay now um, interesting thing there is the the way Critias claims to have come by the story of Atlantis is that he was told by someone who was like told by someone who was told by Solon, one of the seven Greek sages, the great, great, great Athenian politician, and is also like a distant relative of Plato's. But Solon is claimed to have picked up the story while traveling to Egypt, where he learned of it at a children's party, the name of which basically translates as to like deception mm. okay so there's no ownership of this as being true whatsoever mm-hmm. but it's it's a revealing myth okay and then we're told all right so here's our plan now we're gonna like talk about the origin of the cosmos and then and then we're gonna return to talk about the origin of civilization as patterned on the ideal city Mm -hmm. um, because first we need to understand the cosmos and how the ideal city is related to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that Timaeus is going to take the ball and give us the origin of the cosmos story. And then Critias is going to come back and give us uh, the origin of civilization story by returning to Atlantis. Okay. Now I know it's all long window. I think it's going to actually important for understanding what's going on in this. No, this is great. This is great stage setting. You're right. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, now, um, Oh, coffee sounds good right now. Isn't I'll it right? Yeah. Out. Oh, yeah. man. man. It's been a long, it's been a long man, week. <laughs> make, a call, make a call, man. Yeah. Okay, so, well, hey, Christine. All right. Yeah, Christine, right? They're, you've got your kids old. Nothing with a cup of coffee. Yeah, they, they're Although sure. I had an espresso machine like blow up in my face yesterday. I like, I almost got my face blown off by a Mr. Coffee espresso machine. Oh, no. Was this in the office or at home? You know, at home. At home. Like, like literally the cap of that thing dented the ceiling when it blew off of it yeah my, so, la- my land Dr. So Jim. <laughs> when, when the espresso machine starts to go let it go 
Mm-hmm. Like don't don't try to hold on to that thing longer. <laughs> right? Because yeah. the stakes are high. The same goes for those magic bullet uh machines too. Like if that smoothie wants to explode all over the yeah. ceiling, you let it yeah. explode, let right? It go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So here's what I want to do. I want to look at like um I want to now actually get a little closer to the text. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. Now in my translation, we then get what they call a prelude. In the in the actual there aren't divisions in the actual dialogue. Okay. All right. So um Timaeus is going to give this origin of the universe story. Okay. And initially we get, okay, you know, we should have an invocation to the gods before we do anything. Right? So we're going to pour our wine out a little bit here, right, for the gods. But then Timaeus says, but we should be able to do some of this on our own. This is an all revelation. Okay. So it does seem to be that human reason has some grip on the way things are going to go. Okay. Now, do you mind if I read a little bit? Oh, please do. Okay, yeah. Okay. So if you're following at home, I'm right at, it'd be like 27D going into 28A. Mm-hmm. In, in the Timaeus. So Timaeus says, we must, in my opinion, begin by making the following distinctions. What is that which always is and has no becoming? And what is that which is always becoming, but never in any way is? It's a question, right? The one is apprehensible by intelligence with an account, but always the same. And the other is the object of opinion together uh, with ir- with with irrational sense perception becoming and ceasing to be but never really being. In addition, everything that comes that becomes must do so owing to some cause, for nothing can come to be without a cause. Continuing then, whenever then the craftsman of anything keeps his eye on the eternally unchanging and uses some such thing as his pattern for the form and function of his product, the result must be good. Whenever he looks to something that has come to be and uses a model, that has been generated, the result is not good. Okay, lots going on there, right? But first, you get classic platonic distinction between being and becoming, right? Mm-hmm. There's there's that which is, okay, what is that? That's the eternal, the unchanging, that is the ideal, okay? And then on the other hand, you have becoming, which is like accessible by per- sense perception. It's only capable of our having opinions about it. It's subject to change, variation, and contingency. It's the real as opposed to the ideal, okay, or the actual, okay. All right, now, interestingly here, though, then, we're told, okay, not surprisingly to us now, Mm -hmm. right, in addition, everything that becomes must do so owing to some cause, for nothing can come to be without a cause, all right? But then the example that Plato has to me is give the flesh that out is about craftsmen who base their product on an ideal as opposed to pr- uh, craftsmen who base their product on something actual. Do you see that? So the relevant sense of cause here that Timaeus is worried about is what? The final. The final. Yeah. Right. Well, the formal. Yeah. It's yeah. not the moving. Right. Mm-hmm. You see that. Okay. So right there, like the kind of account we're getting of the quote unquote origin of the universe is pretty different from what like you and I come to expect from such an account. Sure. Right. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? right? Okay. Like it's more like, and I'm going to say more, it's very clear here is what he is worried about is what is the ideal mm-hmm. right, on which the universe is patterned. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. Because think of it. What's the question of the dialogue? Like, well, you know, at least like the, the literary occasion for the dialogue is, well, I've got an ideal of what the city should be. Right. But what would a what would a city patterned after that be like? Right. Well, how do we do that? We have to first start out with what's the ideal. And so really what we're after here in the natural theology part of this thing is what's the ideal on which the universe is based. Yeah. And it will all be an explanation, ultimate explanation that is in terms of the good. Yeah, exactly. Because think of it. It's like so for Plato, even if you have a creator God, the question will be, okay, but why? Like, why mm-hmm. did that God create this, right? Yeah. Okay, and so the answer to that is only going to ultimately come in some kind of ideal because that's what's best, right? It's in a, it's a, in a broad good. sense a moral explanation. It's a moral right? explanation. You can see uh-huh. why, like, like give him stuff that you know is important to me and stuff. Like, this went off like a bomb for me, right? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. It's, 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 I think it's ultimately correct. It's right? correct, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then go on to the next paragraph here. So then um, Timothy continues, as for the whole heaven, let us call it 
uh, that or the world or any other name most acceptable to it. Okay, so the world, we're explaining the world. We must ask about it the question one has to ask to begin with about anything, whether it always was and had no origin of coming into being or whether it has come into being having started from some origin. The answer is that it has come into being for it is visible and tangible and corporeal and all such things are perceptible by the senses. And as we saw, I take it in the Republic, right? Uh, perceptible things are objects of opinion and sense perception and come into being and are generated. Okay, so the world's got to have a cause, right? And it is necessary, we said, for what has come into being to have done so by some cause. Okay, then he goes on. This is, I think, the important, interesting part. So far, like kind of standard cosmological reasoning, right? Yep. He says, to discover the maker and father of this universe is indeed a hard task. And having found him, it would be impossible to tell everyone about him. Okay. And then he says, let us return then to uh, one second. Here. That's all right. I, if you can't hear, my kids are slamming the piano downstairs. So I'm having my, my mic intermittently muted as well. <laughs> so then he says, uh, let us then return uh, to ask the following question about it. Okay. So he I'm going to get to what that question is, but he changes the subject. Okay. So does the universe have a cause? Well, yeah. In the sense of some kind of agency, he thinks, yeah, it must have to because it's contingent like all perceptible stuff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But says Timaeus, hey, who that is, what that is, too hard. I don't know, right? Okay, we weren't there. That's a question about what actually happened, right? And I can only reason by account to what ideally happens. Mm -hmm. You see that? So he claims no knowledge whatsoever of like the, the, the agency that brings about the universe. That's like yeah. a blank hole in this thing mm -hmm. you see that? okay but then we get then we say but let us then uh ask the following question about it to which pattern did its constructor work and that which remains the same and unchanging or uh that which has come to be so the question isn't who or what or whether something brings about the universe it's what pattern the universe is based on what's the ideal on which the universe is based okay so do you see that? Like, it's like, it's like Plato, I think it's very important. So Plato's cosmological question is different from our cosmological question, or at least mm -hmm. our, I mean, like, contemporary. Like, if you went and looked at, like, contemporary debates, like, calam arguments and stuff like that. <laughs> go, go look at Bill Craig's stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Plato, like, like Plato is, utter, like, is utterly bored by that. Mm -hmm. He's like, okay, yeah, so some, some agency brought it about. So what? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, what he wants to know is what's the pattern, right? What's the ideal, whatever agency brought it about is operating toward? Because yeah. we need to know that to know how to like live our lives. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He. Yeah. yeah. He wants uh like the thickest kind of explanation you can possibly get. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do, do, do you see that? Okay. An explanation that has real practical, meaningful existential significance to us. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, do you mind if I continue on with this? Oh, but yeah, this is great. Keep so going. Says, if this world here is beautiful and its maker good, clearly he has an eye on the eternal. If the alternative, which is blasphemy even to mention is true, then on something that has come into being, clearly he, he had his eye on the eternal for the world is the fairest of all things that have come into being. Uh, and he is the best of causes in this way it must have been crafted on the pattern of what is apprehensible by reason and understanding and eternally unchanging. These things being so, it is in every way necessary that the world is a likeness of something. Okay. So what's, I mean, it's interesting. What do you, we only get conditionals there. Like, okay, if it's a good world, then it had to be based on an eternal ideal, right? The suggestion that it's not a good world is blasphemous and mm -hmm. silly. Therefore, it must be based on some internal internal ideal. Mm, you see mm -hmm. that? Okay. What I find fascinating here is, man, we're like fast forward to Leibniz now. Right. Yeah. Uh huh. Did you see it? You like 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 this is in order for this thing to make sense. It's like so. It seems like to say the world isn't beautiful and like may even go so far as Leibniz perfect, right? Mm, or as good mm -hmm. as, as good as as good as a world could be. Right, mm -hmm. is like unthinkable and blasphemous, and maybe because that means nothing is intelligible now, right? Mm -hmm. And so then we have to say it's based on an eternal ideal. 
You know what right. I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so once again, like, like, like it's a very different kind of natural theology here, right? Like the primary premise is that the world is a good world, right? Right. Uh -huh. And if it's a good world, then it must be based on something in eternity and not merely just be, you know, something that just so happened. Right. Which is why we'll get this account of the Demiurge, which we have to talk about at some point in the cartoon yeah, 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 versus yeah, yeah. the real yeah, well, version of that, yeah. wanting the world to be as beautiful, as beautiful as possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and, and. And, and he says, well, he'll go on to say, because the Demiurge isn't greedy, right? He's, he's not <laughs> jealous of his creation, right? Uh -huh. Okay, but but even, so, what's, what I find interesting now is, um, I won't read the whole thing, but now Timia says, okay, so, the the level of certainty an account has matches, like, the, the stability of the being that it describes, okay? So, mm -hmm. accounts of the ideal... Uh, match like are, are like absolutely certain because mm -hmm. their object is absolutely certain right yeah. it's absolutely stable accounts of what happens are are a little loosey-goosey because mm -hmm. what happens is a little loosey-goosey that's right okay? yeah. yeah so he ends up saying here he's in, in in i checked all the translations they all say the same thing is what follows is a likely myth it's a likely myth okay um because now you want to know okay okay He's already, does the world come about according to an ideal? Yes, it has to. Why? Because it's a good world. Okay. Now, how did that come about? Well, gee, if you ask me how things came about, now we're in loosey-goosey actuality, right? Mm -hmm. And I can only tell you uh, a likely myth about it. Uh, yeah, a probable story, right? A probable mm -hmm. story. Just like, but look at the analogy. Like, okay, you want to know what the ideal city is? I can tell you what that is, right? By account. Go read the Republic, Okay. Mm -hmm. If you want to know what would, how would a, a, like a, a ideal city that's patterned after that work in reality, I can only tell you a myth about it. Right. Uh huh. Do you see what I mean? Okay. So, so is Plato committed to any of the details in what follows? I say he's not. No. Right. Not. And it's and it's by thinking that he is that you you might commit yourself to again a rather cartoonish version yeah exactly was right, right? Yeah. you see what i mean like 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 he what he's saying here is okay this thing has got to be based on an ideal right let's suppose it is based on the ideal okay it's like it like let's suppose this is the best the best world there could be right mm -hmm. now what would the process be of forming that world and what would that world be like okay mm -hmm. Well, okay, it's no one can say for sure because the world's in motion and all that, but I'm going to give you a myth, the structure of which should tell us what that world would be like. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you're going to get like this like completely strange, oh, weirdo story, okay? But I think Plato knows it's that. I think he knows he's just making it up for the most part, right? Mm -hmm. But it's the structure of it that he's saying that these are the conditions of what a world would have to be like if it follows the pattern. Right. And that is what is ultimately most revealing. Yes. Yes. Right. And as we'll see, as we go on, as we go on in this thing, right. Yep. So what do we find out? Like it, the world has got to be, you know, like it, it has to be an organism of a sort. Like it, like it had, the world has got to be conscious and intelligent and operated mm -hmm. by theological principles and has to have room for other like, like conscious animals, intelligent like us, beings, yep. intelligent mm -hmm. beings, et cetera. And we like, maybe as we go on, if you do more parts of this, yeah, like, we're going to have to yeah, <laughs> we're gonna have to. Right. But you, we could talk about that, but all along the point is not, Oh yeah, there's four elements and only four. Right. 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 Yeah. Like the whole thing is really running in circles. Right. right. Or there's really this lowercase G God, it's yeah. like a literal demiurge, craftsman, yeah. Yeah. right? No, that's I don't that's, like, yeah, the demiurge. I don't think for a second Plato's saying seriously there's a demiurge, mm -hmm. right? What he's saying, there's got to be an agency, yeah, okay. But don't ask me what the hell that agency is. That's what he just said here. I don't know, Jeez, right? I, I wasn't there. And, and and spoiler alert from Gerson Gerson is, yeah. I was talking with Jim about this, like, he's he seems very scholastic in the sense he's he's like, no, the demiurge yeah. is just the divine intellect, that's all the yeah. demiurge is, right? Or, uh -huh. yeah, or, or not I some think... lowercase g, you know middleman yeah. right yeah what, what i read what i read aristotle's theology as is filling in that blank spot yeah uh-huh right but it turns out like what the agency is isn't a demiurge it's it's the it's the news thinking itself and we'll maybe get into that later right right but i see like what we're getting here for plato is like one side of the problem okay mm -hmm. like what what is what what 
like what would the relationship into the universe and the ideal be? Okay, so okay, it had to be like patterned after it. Okay, what would the pattern be that we would find, and how would it go about? Well, I'm going to give you like a myth that structurally gives you that, but it's all very murky because it's like beyond the human can. He says because we're humans, we can only do a myth for this, right? Yeah. You see that, and the, so the whole bit about a demiurge that looks up to the forms and like stamps the the already existing matter with it with the forms. That's that he's not serious about that, right? right? Mm -hmm. But it would have to, but, but what a world that is worthwhile would be would indeed have the impression in some sense of the forms in the matter, right? Do, do mm. you know what I mean? Et cetera, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, so, I mean, that, that to me then is like the program that's going on in the Timaeus. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, is that a good natural pause point for part yeah, I one? Think it is. Yeah. It's so like, maybe next time we'll get into like, okay, now here's, here's like the first part of the spooky myth. Right? Yeah. And then, and then, you know, and then work our way. Maybe if we actually do the Critias and we'll get like weird with the Atlantis. Yeah, yeah. Why not? That's great. That was a brilliant, that was a brilliant overview, by the way. So cool. that was, that, that was awesome. I hope that the gentle listeners find that helpful as they approach the text and read the damn book. As we read like it. to say, yep. you got yep. You can't just do the podcast. You got to read the damn book. As we like to say. Yeah. And I would say too, you have to actually like, I mean, not just look at the words, not just look for it to, uh, you know, like affirm your intuitions, but actually read what, what the guy's saying. Cause a lot of times it's very different. Yeah. What to expect. Yeah. Let's uh, let's close out with a question here. Jim sure. meow, meow, meow wants to know if we use nootropics, for example, phenylparacetam, celastrus, or certain mushrooms, lions, lion's mane, perhaps, et cetera. Uh, I do not. Jim? I don't really, no. <laughs> nope. My yeah, positive yeah. booster is pretty much just caffeine and yeah. I'm not, and I'm nowhere near the caffeine fiend that the uh, gym is either. I'm kind of like one to one and a half ish yeah, cups right, of coffee right, per day. Yeah. And that's about as much as I could take. Oh, before I start. I'm like one, one and a half ish cups per hour. Right. right yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I mean, the only supplement I use is um, uh, I take vitamin D. Good, yeah, man. That's like a vitamin D, a fish oil. Yeah, that's like those are probably, uh, you know, worth checking yeah. out for a lot of people. I would sure. do, I would do a fish oil if I didn't eat so many sardines. I think I probably, I'm oh, if you're doing, that. if you're actually eating fish and sardines, you really yeah. don't need the, yeah. the fish oil. And I, I, I only take it intermittently. Um, people want a quick rundown on supplements protein, creatine, and caffeine are like obvious tier one. Like these things actually make a difference. Yeah. I don't even take creatine, uh, but it is really well researched and, you know, it can make a meaningful difference, but then there's like a lot in what I would call like tier two, where it probably makes a lot of sense for a lot of people well researched and stuff like that, like the fish oils, the vitamin D and, and stuff like that, or, and like makes sense because most people are probably deficient in a certain sense. Like most people probably aren't getting outside enough and you know, that sort of, yep. that sort of thing. Right. Yep. Uh, but no nootropics, none of that, none of that. Good, good sleep though matters. That's uh, if you want, you want to perform well, focus yes. on getting as best sleep as you possibly can. By all means. All right, professor, what are you going to leave the good people with? Anything else you want to announce or? So yeah, I haven't, I haven't done much uh, in terms of uh, publishing or anything like that lately. So we'll see uh, what's up the pipe there, but. Cool. Well, stay tuned yep. because we'll continue this series uh, as soon as we possibly can. If you like what we're doing here, yep. as always smash that like button headbutt the subscribe button back kick the little bell and we'll see you guys on the next episode fairly well peace peace